Hello and welcome to this webinar, the first in our series of transformation talks on transforming science communication for transformations to sustainability. My name is Lizzie Sayer and I'm the communications officer for the Transformations to Sustainability programme, which is a research programme that puts the social sciences and the humanities at the heart of interdisciplinary research um, on sustainability. I'm based in Paris, France at the International Science Council and our presenters for this webinar today are joining from Kenya, from the Netherlands and from the United States. We'd love to hear from you. Uh, please use the chat box to say hello, tell us who you are and where you're from. You can also use the chat box during the webinar today to ask questions and we'll have a chance to discuss those once we've heard from all of today's speakers. This webinar is being recorded and it will be made available on our website afterwards. Our first presenter today is Susie Moser. Susie's work focuses on adaptation to climate change, especially in coastal areas, on resilience, transformation, decision support, and effective climate change communication in support of social change. Susie is going to talk today about the imperative to transform. So let me uh, just give you the control, Susie, and then we can see your slides. Okay. Can you hear me okay while we're doing that? Yes. Can you see, can you hear me? Hello there, everyone. It's wonderful to be here. Thank you, Lizzie, for inviting me to kick off this webinar series. I'm really uh, delighted to see it um, and delighted to focus on this challenge uh, and the task of ethical science communication um, as part of the transformative uh, process and movement that we will be in. I want to start this off with simply acknowledging where we're at. <laughs> All of you, I hope, are safe and sound. Um, it is a really interesting and precarious moment in the world um, and a really interesting challenge um, for ethical science communication. In some ways, more than ever, we good science communication, ethical science communication. Um, we see it um, when it does occur in the countries where you have good science communication right now about this particular uh, uh, pandemic. And you see it in countries like my own right now where we don't. <laughs> and the chaos and in fact, the profound moral implications of not communicating science effectively. Um, and of course, at the very same time, you know, things like these long these like climate change continue um, and somehow need to be still communicated. Um, but how do you do that when people are in lockdown, when they're in, in panic mode, when their cup of worry that they can deal with is already overflowing? How do you then bring this in when they're in trauma mode? Um, many, many, many thousands of people being uh, hard affected by this pandemic. So. What I want to lay out for you, I'm going to use climate change as my particular focus because um, that's what I work on most of the time. Um, but I, I want to use this opportunity of a disruption of a climate, uh, sorry, not of a climate related, of a, a non-climate related issue like the uh, crisis we're in right now against the backdrop of the transformation we need to go through um, and will go through in one way or another with climate change as the context in which we maybe explore the you know, imperative for transformation and how to talk about it. And so let me just you know, use climate change as, as the way to, to make the case for why we must transform. Um, and I'm going to use here the Paris Accord. Um, you know, well, I don't need to explain it much, but the goal here is, of course, to stay below, well below two degrees of warming uh, above pre-industrial levels. And what that requires um, for us to go through is a uh, fundamental transformation. Um, I sometimes like to call it a blood transfusion of modern society in that all the energy that um, fuels us um, is currently a dirty one um, and it needs to become a clean one, um, right? And, and that will entail profound changes to our economy, 
to the way we think about consuming and what we actually do. Um, it requires enormously well-functioning institutions, which we're getting a glimpse of right now, how well they do that. <laughs> and even if we achieve that, there's still adaptation required to the relatively moderate uh, climate changes that we might achieve. Um, and now just think about it. What if we completely miss that goal and we warm three, four, five, six degrees of, uh, of warming? In that instance, we have extensive deep climate changes and catastrophes to deal with, global shifts in market and production sites that will completely shift how we're doing the economy right now, massive numbers of people migrating. We're already beginning to see what that looks like. Um, we may still attempt to adapt to it, but the you know, consequences of climate change are so challenging um, and adaptation efforts uh, less and less uh, effective that you know, it, we will change every part of our lives. And of course, there's the possibility that we miss the Paris Accord, but also don't go quite to that. So it may be just around two or three degrees. Well, in that case, we will still have more extensive climate changes and catastrophes. We will try our very best to do these emission reductions and adapt. And, you know, quite likely we will see some geoengineering because people don't like to be hot. And you can imagine what that means. So under any scenario I can imagine regarding climate change, there will be transformation. How do we talk about that? Well, one really important uh, way in which communication can support and participate in this transformation is to actually communicate this very imperative that I just laid out. We must talk about that. Um, and of course, then there is the task that communication always has had, which is to support the transformative changes, each of this kind that I just laid out. On the very top, it's how can we bring about the technologies, policies, and behaviors. And we have you know, seen us for years how difficult it is for communication to feed effectively into that. Underneath that, and below these deep changes that we will visibly observe, are profound political, social, economic, legal, institutional changes that we all can help bring about. And of course, even deeper than, than that are the worldviews and norms and beliefs that shape those very deep structures of our society. So there are plenty of ways in which um, communication can support these shifts and must support these shifts. And I would say that requires actually that we change communication itself, both the research and the practice, and I'll say more about that in a moment. And I wanna say the interaction between research about communication, research about climate change, about the solutions to climate change, and how we link to practice. So those to me are the fundamental ways in which communication can support the transformation. I've written in a book chapter um, in this book that you see here on the right um, uh, about you know, just the first top task that I can think of that um, communication and communicators have uh, in helping society move through this transformative change before us. I'm not gonna go through all of them because I don't have the time to do that, but I'm happy to share that um, chapter with people later or um, we can discuss it. But I'm, I wanna give you just a couple of um, examples of the, what these tasks entail. The first one is naming and framing just how profound the change is that is necessary and that is before us. What kind of change is that? Right, we're seeing the struggles with that right now. With lots of people, lots of people are talking about how COVID is going to transform our society. Well, we'll see if that's the case. But it's, you know, do we just think of it as climate change as an instance of, you know, doom and and we're done, or are, are we, you know, how do we communicate what this transformation looks like? Can we find resonant frames that people can relate to, archetypal frames? I think there are. And they often begin with disruption and loss. And when people see that there is sort of a, 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 an archetypal um, pattern to how we do transformation, they can more easily put the events that happen in that frame. So, you know, even the struggles that we will have to go through to make these transformations happen, how to bring to life, if you will, and embody the new ways of being. Um, I think that's a that's something that you know we really need to talk about and make clear to people. I see a huge need for that. Here's another example. Um, 
right now there is a desire for quick fixes and uh, quick answers and quick solutions to the crisis and you can totally understand where that is from right we're all in crisis mode we're all in unusual territory uncertainty is very uncomfortable for most people so when people face climate related transformations there will always be the temptation to do the next easy thing to do the thing that is most familiar and i believe it is one of the principal tasks of communication of this of this time and in this time to help people see that if we did the more difficult tasks the deeper change the more fundamental shifts in our worldviews and behaviors and deeper structures that it actually would lead us to the kind of change we want to see as opposed to you know maybe more business as usual so i think there is a profound need to keep course correcting when people want to go numb when people want to go take the easy option have quick solutions to say really is that really what we want to do right now how do we move people from this you know crisis moment to an opportunity to see the deeper changes the last example i want to give has to do and it speaks directly to science communication um, and that is that one big task communicators have is to help people make sense and meaning of these really difficult times um, we do that actually as far as human history is concerned not through facts but through story can we find a way to tell the facts of what we know in a way that resonates more effectively with how the human brain works that is what this is about. I'm going to leave it here. We can talk about any of the other ones if you want to later. But I think when you know you're beginning to see that we're having to do something as communicators and as researchers of the communication process that's rather different from anything we've done before. We don't have theories of how to communicate in a transformation. We don't have just one discipline that we can go to to have all the answers. We must work together differently. There's, you can't really experiment, right? We're all in it. <laughs> there will be no spectators to the transformation that is driven by climate change. Um, and you know, I, I'm just not going to go through every single point, but you see that the challenge before us as communicators will profoundly um, challenge us to do this differently than we've done before. And the same is true for communication practi practitioners. Where do you start when you're in the, you know, in, distracted like we are right now? Um, with a competing issue, when you have day-to-day -day pressures that just take you away from talking about these long-term changes, with what ethical comp compass do we do this? What vision do we offer in amidst all these growing crises? So each one of us, whether we're on the research end of communication or the practice end of communication, will have to transform ourselves. And that should make you deeply uncomfortable. And I want to say that's perfect <laughs> that's exactly where we ought to be so with that i'm going to just simply and and that involves also very different changes to how we interact right so with that i'm going to just simply hand it back to lizzie and hear from the other presenters and then we'll discuss it so thank you all thank you for that presentation lizzie, are you taking it back yourself or do i have to do something you don't have to do anything Thank you for that presentation, Susie. Our next speaker is going to be Emily Polk, um, and who, yes, Emily should have uh, control of the, the screen now. Welcome to anyone who's just joined the webinar. You can use the chat box to share your questions, and we'll have a chance to put those to Susie and to all the speakers later on. So I can see Emily's slides now. Over to you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much, Lizzie, for inviting me. And thank you so much, um, Susie, for, um, for situating us so powerfully and articulating what is needed to make the changes we need to make during this crisis. For my presentation, I'm going to focus more on how processes and practices for centering uh, marginalized voices in our communication practices um, and in our research. So, and I'm going to talk about how we can use environmental justice frameworks and discourses as a way to have more inclusive science communication. So, the first thing I want to I want to focus on right now. Let's see. Okay, 
is, um, I, you know, I'm going to see if I can make this. Is this better? Okay. Yeah. Um, okay. So the first thing I want to focus on is, um, is, is switching our intention from uh, trying to uh, get equality to focusing more on equity. So we know that any time we do transdisciplinary research, that the playing field is never going to be equal. And I think for many of us, the instinct is to work toward equality. You know, how can we give equal voice to our stakeholders when we communicate about our research? But I think a move toward prioritizing equity is most beneficial for inclusive science communication. And I'd like to, to explain the differences. When we think about equity, we're referring to equality of being fair, equal, oops, equal sharing and division. Equity is a need-based approach focusing on the need of individuals or the community. Um, equality is not necessarily affected by the needs of people or society. Equality gives the same thing to all people regardless of need. Equity is subjective. It differs from situation to situation. Equality assumes the same outcome and end result. Um, equity, people are treated fairly but differently. And equality, people are treated equally but maybe unfairly. So what does this mean for more inclusive science communication? I think shifting our focus to what is fair versus what is equal creates the space for us to center the priorities of marginalized and vulnerable stakeholders in the communication of our research. Centering equity in our communication ensures that we are not making well-intentioned assumptions about the values and needs of others, but actually institutionalizing spaces in our research processes and practices for asking and listening. And what that means specifically, you know, not every stakeholder needs necessarily an equal voice in every single public communication effort, but inclusive science communication means that conversations about what is fair for them in terms of the voice they want to have, when they want to have it, and where, is institutionalized as part of the research process. I think, um, I think environmental justice as a movement, a theory, and a practice gives us a really useful framing and a really useful way um, to enter these conversations and institutionalize more in inclusive science communication. So what is environmental justice? Environmental justice emerged as a movement in the early 1980s in the US as a way to raise awareness of the disproportionate environmental burdens and harms that were occurring and actually continue to occur in communities of color and other poor marginalized communities. The movement de developed ways of thinking and communicating science um, that are really effective. Um, EJ discourse and science communication. Um, uh, EJ environmental justice acknowledges that all communication frames affect audience opinion by not only informing about an issue, but creating the potential to reorient their thinking. And I think this is a really important um, fact to take into consideration in any kind of science communication. What's our obligation here, especially during this time of crisis, as you noted? EJ encourages awareness of historical and current inequities and reflects the lived experience of people on the ground. As a result, framing recognizes how marginalized groups bear the brunt of discriminat discriminatory environmental policies and practices, and we know this is true all over the world. And it emphasizes that scientific knowledge is not divorced from the cultural, social, and political histories out of which it emerges, and it holds itself accountable to those histories as part of the communication process. Um, I wanted to talk very, very briefly about, just give you a very recent example, and again, try to connect it to this current moment with COVID-19. I have a very beloved student of mine, Sierra Garcia. She's a science communicator and a scientist, and she writes for the environmental magazine, Gris. Um, and she wrote a recently wrote an article called Where the Virus, the Pandemic is Bringing Out Environmentalism's Dark Side. And why I love this article so much is that she, as a science communicator, she was really drawing attention to the ways in which we are uh, communicating the current crisis. So she was noting that there, there are numerous tweets about COVID-19 making the argument that overpopulation is the cause of Pandemic. The tweets note that people are sheltering. The, um, the tweets note that people are sheltering in place. Animals are flooding urban streets. There's lower carbon emissions, lower pollution levels, and the blame for environmental harm rests on too many people. Um, and 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 at first glance, this is not untrue, right? We have the science. We know that there are low, lower carbon emissions now that people are sheltering in place. Um, we know that the pollution is level. But as far as science communication goes, as far as inclusive science communication, this kind of, of generalizing and oversimplifying rhetoric um, can be dangerous. Why? Overpopulation rhetoric um, 
it, uh, the targets of this rhetoric have traditionally been non-white developing countries who are actually not responsible for the largest emissions or pollution globally. In the US in particular, this has led to anti-immigration bills and people of color being targets of an ethical state-sponsored population reduction programs and policies, which included Native American women and Chicano women forcibly sterilized throughout the late 1960s and 70s. And finally, it detracts our attention away from the powerful culprit uh, culprits who should be held accountable for the environmental harms they are perpetuating globally. So, um, so um, I just really liked her this article by Sierra for Garcia uh, for the way in which it drew attention to the ways in which science communicators have to be accountable to certain histories in their science communication. I just wanted to end right uh, this presentation by by offering some questions um, that might help in institutionalizing a more inclusive science communication in our research practices. And the reason I frame these as questions rather than prescriptive statements is because um, all transdisciplinary research is going to have different contexts and um, different end results and different expectations for deliverables. Sorry, I'm speaking very quickly here because I know time is limited. Um, and we, but um, but I wanted to just so, sort of offer these uh, these questions. Um, so where is the research shared? Who is the audience it serves? Uh, who benefits in the sharing of information and who was consulted in the sharing? Um, I do want to note that I, I drew some inspiration for these questions from uh, from a blog on the International Science Council's website that I really loved by Dr. Zarina Patel, and I highly recommend it. Um, the Triumphs and Trials of Transdisciplinary Research, Reflections on the Undiscipline Undisciplining of Disciplines. And so, so some of those ideas inform these questions. Uh, what kinds of other opportunities are there for distributing the research so that more people benefit? Who is helping you to prioritize this as a researcher? Um, do you consider different genres in your communication efforts, policy briefs, op-eds, documentaries? What other modes would be relevant? Um, and this, again, it could be institutionalized as part of the conversation with your collaborators, with other stakeholders. Transdisciplinary research must have transdisciplinary and inclusive communication modes and methods. Um, power and agency of stakeholders. What is your own positionality and how is this made visible in your own communication with stakeholders and in publicizing your work? So very often we're thinking about, about the position of our collaborators in our communication efforts, but I'm not sure we, as researchers, we spend enough time situating ourselves within the, the research itself. Um, and so, so that's, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's important to do. Um, relatedly, how is power defined and communicated between stakeholders in your research design? Is the expertise of the science prioritized? What role do people, um, I'm sorry, oops. What role do the people who are meant to benefit from the research have in the research project in assessing and measuring it? Are you centering the voices of the most impacted, not only as vulnerable victims, but as people who have the solutions and expertise? Um, and this is particularly important when we consider equity in our communication processes. And finally, the last two points, communication practices. How, and I, I really love this actually in, in Dr. Patel's article, you know, how is complexity acknowledged? Research is a collaborative and always evolving process. How is the relationship between this complexity and your deliverables discussed with your stakeholders? And how is it discussed in your public communication efforts? Um, and then finally, trust as, is fundamental. And I think this seems obvious to those of us who are researchers or teachers um, and who do this work on the ground. Um, but I think it's so incredibly difficult, especially when your funding is contingent on quantifiable outputs, but relationship building is key to the sustainability of your work and, and, and to sustainable communication practices. So what processes have you built into your communication practices that serve to build this genuine trust? Thank you. Um, thank you for that presentation, Emily. And also for the little mention of the Zarina Patel blog on the ASC website. Um, we will share that with the recording of this video and we'll also share some of the related materials that people are asking for in the questions. Um, so there will be a little package. <laughs> Our next speaker is Ocheng Ogodo, who is the Sub-Saharan Africa Regional Coordinator and Editor for the Science and Development Network, SciDevNet, and which is an online media house that I'm sure many of you know. 
So we're going to hand over to Ho Ching now, um, and I hope you will be able to hear from him. So. Okay, uh, thank you so much for having me um, on this program. I really appreciate it. The first two speakers were really excellent. They gave a very nice uh, presentation. Uh, I really appreciate that one. Um, um, I will talk from the media perspective. I'm a media personality, and I've been working for the media for pretty long. And I think uh, the issues that I want to deal with um, are around um, as an editor and as a journalist as well, why is it important to hear uh, from new and diverse voices about global change? Well, there's so many changes that are going on globally um, uh, because the, the world has become a very small space and therefore there is a lot of interaction uh, between different communities, different people, different cultures, different uh, professional backgrounds. Um, and, and that one uh, calls for a uh, real expanse of the, of the knowledge space. So as a media personality, it's, it's very important uh, for me in my work to hear from diverse voices. And the reasons that makes that one pretty important um, now, uh, as, as the media itself, number one is that you, it will give you the opportunity to hear different perspectives of people uh, that what 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 they want, what kind of change they want, or what kind of backgrounds and context they operate in, and how that one I mean uh, affects the, uh, the affects the perspective when it comes to global change. So as a media personality, that one is very important. It gives you a wide room, a latitude. Um, to really get to know what's happening in different places. So that is a very key issue uh, as a media personality. Number two, uh, being a media personality is that you always start from the, uh, the point of doubt. You do, don't just take everything the way they come. And therefore, if you really wanna get to the bottom of the issue, then one of the fundamental things that you have to do is to get as different perspectives as possible. Remember, your work is to help people make informed choices. And you can only do that one if you avail uh, different ideas from different people so that they can interrogate these ones and come up with the best uh, thing that they want to do and they want to implement. And that in itself is going to lead to um, a global change. So that is quite important. The third, uh, the third point is that it's, it's um, in terms of knowledge, uh, for a journalist, um, you really need to uh, put out um, uh, the products that are really knowledgeable. And therefore, you can only do that one if you get a different perspectives from different people. Um, you have to give a package that when somebody goes or reads that one, uh, then the person gets the various voices, the various solutions, uh, and the various conclusions that will be very helpful uh, in transforming uh, the way people live. And, and, and um, these things are very important in the context of creating a transformation to sustainability. Now, if you want something that uh, is sustainable, then the best thing that you do is to talk to people and out of that one, you will see how they do operate in those contexts and how their perspectives can lead to transformations as well as sustainability. So to me, that one is very important as a journalist or as a media personality. Now, the other thing that I want to talk about is how you work with scientists. How, or, uh, how do you do that? Um, it's, it's obvious some of the media people are, um, most of the media people are no scientists. We are only trained in communication, but all the same, um, you want to work uh, with scientists. So what, in this sense, do you need to do uh, if you really want to work with these uh, people? Uh, first, I, I believe, or uh, my belief is that scientists work uh, for the sake of uh, people. They work in a context, they work in an ecosystem, and therefore, uh, whatever they do needs to be communicated. Uh, if they have to lead to transformation, the basic thing that is needed out of their scientific products, scientific works, 
is the ability to communicate that one. And that's pretty much where the media comes in uh, because we reach the masses. Uh, and therefore, one of the fundamental things that um, is important for me is to work with artists uh, for authority. Now, these are people who are trained. These are people who think in a trained way. And these are people who interrogate problems and issues within a context or in a society. Now, if you really want to get to know uh, the real authority of, uh, of, of the issues they have dealt with, then the best thing you can do is to talk to scientists. And me at SciDev.net, uh, um, I interact with scientists on a daily basis, whether I'm talking about climate change, whether I'm talking about uh, COVID-19, whether I'm talking about startups or innovations that are coming up and how they're disrupting, their people, uh, disrupting people's lifestyles then the best thing to do is to talk to scientists. Um, the other thing that happens uh, pretty much is that you really have to create a rapport uh, with scientists. But the reason for doing that one, it makes them to find it easy to talk to you. Uh, it makes it uh, easy for them to have confidence in you, but you will talk to them. And for the sake of accuracy, you really need to talk, bring them as much close as possible because I've reported on different aspects of um, um, uh, uh, topics. I've, I've reported on business, I've done politics, but Sam's reporting is rather unique and it's, it's, it's uh, a different thing altogether. So you really need to work very close with scientists if you have to understand uh, that scientific language uh, and see how best it can be downgraded into an easy to understand um, language for the majority of the people, uh, especially those not in the world of science movement, those who are outside it. So you really have to get to know that. Um, and again, as, as a media personality, um, uh, it's also important in terms of getting diverse voices when you're talking to scientists, it's also important to talk to the people who may not be within the science movement but they work, the scientists work amongst them. For example, if you are doing a research on malaria, it's important to talk to scientists who are doing that research, but at the same point, it's very important that you talk to the people um, that the research is being done amongst. The reason is that they have the best experience of what the problem is. Um, they haven't, uh, um, they have, they have suffered from it, it's, it's something like sickness, and therefore you get to know the exact pain that these people um, are undergoing through. But even more than that one, what is the expectation from different uh, stakeholders? What do they expect from the government? What do they expect from scientists? Um, how do they see uh, development uh, partners in terms of helping alleviate the situation they are uh, faced with? So I think that one makes it really, really important uh, that you talk to the people uh, who are involved. I mean, for instance, right now, we are having the COVID-19, which is um, uh, sweeping across the world and causing great uh, misery to people. So you will talk to the doctors who are concerned, who are involved in uh, handling people, you'll talk to the nurses, but it's equally important to talk to the people themselves those who are impacted, those who are infected, as well as those who are affected by the pandemic itself. And that will help you give a very balanced way uh, um, uh, of reporting. And in so doing, you will make it very easy for people to understand the problem, as well as to know the choices that are available to them. And then my last uh, uh, point that I want to talk about is this, uh, uh, who have concerns about uh, new sources uh, used in reporting when they need to build trust uh, in communities uh, where they are working. So, I, I mean, when you report about um, uh, new uh, developments or new research going on, uh, if you talk to the people who are impacted or people who really expect that research to impact on them or the research will be done amongst them, then the most important thing is to talk to them. That one also gives them the confidence in science itself, because one of the roles of the media is to create a culture of science amongst the people. 
that culture may not be readily available. And therefore, part of the duty of a media personality like myself is to ensure that you create that culture of science. And in so doing, you help in furthering the science movement, in furthering uh, research and development uh, for the benefit of people. Uh, thank you so much. Unless there's anything uh, that I need to respond to. Many thanks for that presentation, O Cheng, and thank you to all our listeners for the questions coming in. Um, now, to get the discussion started, I've asked for a first response from Lidza Herzog, who's Associate Professor at the Faculty of Philosophy and the Center for Philosophy, Politics and Economics at the University of Groningen. And Lisa is leading, co-leading the Global Young Academy project on trust in young scientists, of which one of the key components is about science communication and science ethics. Lisa, can I hand over to you to get the questions started? And I will start putting together the questions that have come in through the chat box. Hello, can you hear me? I'm not sure. Yeah, hello. Uh, well, thank you, everyone. So far, there was a lot of food for thought. And I just want to briefly pick up the notion of trust that was mentioned here, because science communication is not worth the effort if the general public doesn't trust um, scientists. And I think that's an aspect that was implicit in all of the talks, and it was made explicit in two of three. So I think that's very important. And as Lizzie mentioned, in this project that we're developing in the Club Young Academy, we have been thinking about, how, you know, what you can do, what kind of communication is useful for about three years now. And we very quickly realized two things. The first is that young scientists are actually in a very good position to take on the task. They are familiar with social media. They are less the sort of typical uh, white elderly men in lab coats so they are sort of not the stereotypical scientists and so they can reach out to different kinds of troops so that's a good thing and lots of young scientists from what we've heard are very interested in this but one other aspect that also became very clear to us is that in order to be trustworthy that the ethical dimension is really important because in the past science has often been perceived as driven not really sort of by the will to serve the general public, but it was sometimes, you know, bought by special interests or it was only serving certain parts of society. And so if you want to go out and communicate, you need really to think about um, your role in society, the ethical pitfalls that, that Emily talked about, which, you know, past injustices might you have to address. And, and so that's, that's really important in thinking about this. And just to give you a brief, um, uh, yeah, example of how important this can be. So, so, so in my country, I'm, I'm originally from Germany. Um, there is now a lot of science communication going on because of COVID, and those people who are perceived as most trustworthy are actually those that are, in a way, most humble and modest. Um, and they say, "Oh, that's something I don't know anything about. I can only speak as a citizen here, not as a scientist." Or they say. That's something where we have only one study, we need to do more research. Um, so they are very clear about what they can say, but also about what they can't say. And just as a question or sort of question and comment that I wanted to raise to the panelists, um, what we also realized in our group is that the challenges for why scientists are not perceived as trustworthy are actually quite different in different countries. So one of our group members from India said, in India, it's always the charge of plagiarism that you get. Whereas in, in Europe, there are many worries about industry influence on science and so lack of independence. So maybe you could say a little bit about the different challenges in different countries, maybe also different parts of science and how we can overcome all this past baggage that science is still carrying with it in lots of in, in the minds of lots of people in order to build trust in science and thanks again to the panelists it was really very interesting thanks for that question so if i can hand over to our panelists now and 
That was a great question to get us started. And I can see that some of the attendees are also asking about things like like differences in language. For many people, the fact that a lot of science communication happens in English is a limiting factor. Um, could you maybe talk to how you address those questions in your work, as well as responding to Lisa's question? Yeah, I don't know whether I can take a go. Can I? Hello? Hi, we can hear you well. Thank you. Oh, you can hear me? All right. I mean, what I want to say is that uh, how, to, how do you create um, uh, trust? I mean, I think uh, one of the fundamental things that you need to really do is to understand uh, the context in which uh, that science is being applied. Uh, that is very important, including their cultural um, um, way of life. Because sometimes when you go into a, into a group of people, then there are certain things that are so significant about their lifestyles that if you touch on those ones, then definitely you're not going to really make impact. So one of the fundamental things that I think needs to be done is to strive as much as possible to cultivate a very good understanding between you and that group of people uh, so that in you they can see you as one of them not see you as somebody who is coming from outside and most likely to interfere with the way they are living so that would be quite a good rapport that makes it uh, you to penetrate much deeper and also to gain their confidence um, and, and to give you the, the room to influence um, change in that particular society and i do agree that you've talked about language language is a very important thing um, and sometimes it's very important to really think about the language that you're using uh, when you are talking to a group of people not everybody understands english especially when you come to africa quite a large number of people may not be able to understand you so the most important thing is really to try to work with the people who can help you really reach down uh, to the people and give it in a language that you're able to understand. Uh, well, that's my take for that. Lizzie, I don't know how you're going to do this, so can I just add to this? Sure, please go ahead. Okay, um, so I guess one of the things that I want to say is that um, trust is not a unidimensional issue. Um, trust relies on the communicator displaying competence, um, displaying openness and honesty, um, showing empathy, um, being reliable and you know accessible in in sort of repeated um, ways and having a a clear voice over time. And so, you know, that gives science in many instances a leg up, right? Particularly on the dimension of competence. But in many other instances, we as scientists have not shown enough empathy. Cheng spoke very nicely to this when he asked, you know, you need to understand your audience. You need to actually understand their context. That is a form of getting at the that empathetic understanding. Um, of where people are at. And so, you know, you can speak all the truth in the world, but if you just come across as a completely cold and, and disinterested person in your audience, you're not going to be effective. And how each of these dimensions is affected in the different cultural contexts, that, that I think explains or goes a long way for explaining um, what Lisa mentioned, this, this, you know, finding that in different countries, um, you see different levels of trust in science. And of course, we have to remember that there is a media environment in which people are bombarded with information. Um, if people do not have a deep scientific grounding, um, all of that information is filtered basically through their cultural lenses. Or this very well, um, that this is how people take up information and filter out what they don't want to hear or what doesn't fit into those preconceived notions. So th those are some of the, the ingredients I see. Um, and I think, you know, you need to work on all of those dimensions, if you will, uh, including the 
uh, ability to receive, which is affected by the cultural milieu you create as um, you know, a policymaker, as, as a decision maker, um, as a teacher, as an educator. What kind of uh, receptivity are you fostering uh, in your country? In this country here in the US, um, people have you know, um, basically a, a very big lack of, of good science education. And so if you don't have that, you just see this information, it fits your values and you accept it, whether or not it's true or not. You can't distinguish. So those are factors that, that play into it. And it's challenging to overcome. There's no one answer to it. Thank you so much to both of you. I, I um, Is it okay if I add, this is Emily, is it okay if I add, um, just build upon what has been said and just add a couple things? Sure, please go ahead. Um, I, I think um, just building upon this 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 idea of empathy, I, I think I cannot begin to say enough about the importance of humility in these contexts and um, also of being authentic around articulating your own positionality as a scientist when you come into these communities that are not your own, um, uh, you know, being making visible uh, in, in dialogue, who you are, what your intention is, what um, uh, uh, as part of the communication process that goes into the research. I think all of us, you know, in developed countries, developing countries, absorb information through a cultural lens, through our own identity. No matter no matter what our life experience is, is um, we take information in through through our culture and um, being putting humility as a value first and foremost in our communication um, is essential. Um, and, and as well as that respect and respect for multiple ways of, of being experts, of being knowledge bearers, being knowledge producers. And so um, I, I think, I just can't say enough of, of what that means for building that trust long-term with our research and in, in, in spaces that are not necessarily our own communities. Thank you for all those interventions. Um, we've had a lot of questions coming in, so I'm just going through those. One that I wondered if we could turn to now um, comes from Shreya Chakraborty. Now, we're, we're talking today um, in this webinar uh, as part of the Transformations to Sustainability program, and which has a big transdisciplinary research component. And one of our questions from Shreya says, I'm going to read it to you. Uh, from our fieldwork, we see that there is immense local and traditional knowledge about resources, climate, and resource-based activities and practices. How do we ensure that science communication does not become arrogant of their hard data science and incorporates traditional knowledge? And can you suggest any practical ways in which um, science communicators and scientists who are communicating about their, their research can make sure those voices are heard um, in their practice. So I'm putting this to all of our panelists. Um, I don't know if anyone wants to speak first. Susie? Happy to jump in. Yeah, I'm happy to jump in. I mean, you know, I think it, this is a perfect um, echoing of Emily's point just now about the humility. I mean, it so much depends on the scientists and their attitude toward both science and other ways of knowing and how they convey it. I think the one sort of um, addition I would, would add to what Emily very nicely said is there is a way in which as scientists, we can be colonial yet again. We can extract from people, we can take without respecting um, the integrity of their knowledge or that it is theirs. And I, I want to urge everyone in most uh, concrete ways that if you have not worked in indigenous communities or in, in communities that, as she says, that are not your own, then have, you know, make contact, learn about that contact, get training in how to interact um, with people respectfully and effectively and build a trust to those communities first and then simply ask them what is okay for anybody to share. It's not yours to convey their knowledge, right? It is 
it is essentially theirs to convey their own knowledge. But I think as a communicator, we can facilitate dialogues in which all ways of knowing are respectfully held. And I think that is the task um, that you know is is right in the on the money. I think in terms of changing the way we act as communication researchers, as researchers, as practitioners, right? That we communicate with others in dialogic forms, not think that we have all the truth and they have none, and let's just you know dump it on them. That's that's a completely disrespectful way. So I think this is where we're challenged to change our own practice. Yeah, I think just to add something small um, on that one um, is that when you go into probably um, a context or you go into a group of people, then I think one of the most important things you do is to create um, a, a, a good understanding between you and those uh, particular people. Make them open up to you, um, make them feel you're one of them, make them feel uh, you are part of their joy or part of their problems and that way they will see you as one of them. So it's, it's very uh, important to do that, other than going like um, you have something to download onto them, which in a sense uh, makes them see you as looking down upon them and their way of life. So I think that is absolutely uh, very important. Uh, the other point that I want to make is that uh, within a, a particular community or within a particular group, there are people who are very influential and people who always uh, shape the direction that the people do take when they want to do things. So I think as, as researchers or as uh, uh, communicators, one of the most important things we need to do is to identify these kind of people as entry points into their, uh, the, the wider society. Um, they are very influential. They know, they're knowledgeable about their own way of life. Uh, they are listened to, uh, they're always respected. And therefore, if you're seen with them, uh, it's it's like, uh, yes, he recognizes even our own good people that are helping us. So I think that is absolutely important, uh, both at communication level as well as at research level, um, and, and bring them closer to you. Thanks. I just had one other idea. This is Emily. I just I just had one other idea that speaks directly to that question around ensuring uh, that voices are represented from the community who have these knowledges, who already have this knowledge of the science. And I think one thing that's also important and interesting to consider are different genres and different modes of communicating. So are there dialogues going on between what are the best practices? Like what do the community members want to see in terms of, I mean, would it be, what do they want to, uh, would they, their voice want to be heard in a social media or in an academic article or in a documentary? You know, we're talking about all different contexts and all different methods and modes of communicating. And so I think having those kinds of dialogues too with your collaborators, with other stakeholders, not only about um, voice, but about how that voice, the, the, the pathway through which that voice is going to be communicated. Can this be a collaborative dialogue as well? Thanks for those answers. As time is moving on, I'd just like to put uh, one final question to all of our presenters, and I'd ask, like to ask uh, Lisa if, if you'd like to respond to this as well. Um, it's a question that's just come in, and it says, one of the major challenges of communicating science is not only to frame your message in a way that's understood to the audience you aim for, but that your message is powerful enough to win over the current narrative. Alternative narratives are often too complex and too far from reality to be taken seriously. How can we overcome this structural problem? So it's a, it's a big question. I, I don't know if um, you would like to come in first. Uh, Susie, Emily, or Cheng, do you have any thoughts to, to come in with on alternative narratives? I'm happy to start, but yeah, happy to I mean, leave. Okay, go on, go on, just go on. Okay, we're gonna pass on the baton here many, many times. So to not waste time, I'll, I'll just speak, but um, so 
I think there are many different opportunities to interrupt the current narrative and try to create a space for an alternative one. Um, and I will maybe use the, uh, the current situation as an example. I think there is at this very moment uh, in our society an openness to thinking differently. Um, that is quite, I mean, that wasn't there two months ago. Um, at least not in, in my context, I've not ever seen anything like this. Um, whether it's through a, this massive disruption of our daily practices, a massive destruction or disruption of how we do things, um, and you know, really opening up a, a space for us to see both what's working, what's not working in society. And I think this is an, such a ripe opportunity to say, to point that out. This is what I meant in, in many ways when I uh, suggested one of the tasks is to help frame that, um, that transformative movement, that opportunity. Um, so I think right this moment would be a way to say, let's look at this. What's, you know, what of this do we wanna retain? What of this do we want to change? Where are the opportunities? How do we think about this moment? Um, and I think that's when you know you also have a receptive audience. I think it's it's difficult because none of us have it all ready and figured out. But I think one of the messages you're getting from this is maybe it's not about just delivering messages, but to be engaged with your audiences wherever they are, to be in dialogue about it and say, what do you think? You know, none of us have gone through this level of transformation. We don't know it. So we're not the experts. I'm <laughs> sorry. We may know, you know, a tad bit more about social transformation than the rest of the world, but quite frankly, none of us have gone through it. It feels very different being in one than talking about one. So engage people in dialogue to work it out together, but use those moments when they arrive. Thank you. I think what I may add um, um, on that one is that uh, sometimes uh, change uh, is gradual and sometimes change is very difficult to uh, to achieve. Um, if people have been used to doing certain things a uh, certain way in a pretty long time and therefore one of the things that I think needs to be done is to try to initiate uh, that change from within. Uh, in other words, let the change come from within. Um, just uh, develop the techniques that can make you have um, the change coming within from the people and then it uh, goes through them and then they accept it as their own way of change, as their new narrative, other than you going and say, this is the narrative that you have to uh, take on board right now. People may be very resistant about that one, but if you make it come from within themselves, if you have your own contact build within them, and this contact becomes useful in helping you create the new narrative, then the chances of, of success are pretty much higher than when you go and it's like you're downloading something onto them that they may resist and that they may see as going against their own normal way of life, going against their norms, uh, going against their culture and their traditions and their way of thinking and the way of perception as a community. So I think one of the best things to do is to really try to make it uh, come from within. It may be gradual, it may take time, but in the long run, it's something that they, go, they, they will own by themselves and say, we did this one instead of somebody came here and forced us to do this and we don't want it to happen. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Can I, oh, can I, it, is it, okay, um, I think, um, I think I, I would only just like to add that um, that I take I take great hope from the fact that narratives are always changing and always evolving. So this notion of disrupting old narratives, while it is important, I think it's important also to not suggest that narratives are ever stagnant or ever not changing. We're always in the process of evolving and changing. And I I just I, I draw, draw great hope from from these moments of opportunity. Um, I, I always I think often of that Rebecca Solnit quote where she says the future is dark with darkness as much of the womb as the grave. Um, it's it's sort of our choice and um, and there's great agency there in thinking about 
in thinking about the possibilities that we have in this moment um, to have to to make the changes we need to make in this in this current time. Again, yeah, to add just two very small points. Um, one is when I do science communication, I always see people's faces change when you acknowledge that you had certain narratives that you accepted as dominant in the past as well and then you started working on them and you realized what was wrong with them because that creates a kind of personal connection and in terms of how you frame new narratives that are very complicated and that seem to have a disadvantage because of the complexity compared to um, existing narratives i think one can also learn a lot about how to actually make stories simple without making them wrong and how to find the right metaphors how to frame um, messages there is an element of just know how to that um, and there is quite some good online material on science communication with the GYA we hope to put out more stuff for people and I think that's not something one can to a certain extent also learn and those who are putting on other narratives I mean the professional PR departments of companies and so on they are of course very good at this and I think to some extent scientists need to catch up a little bit in terms of how good we are at telling the stories that are really based on, on science and on the best uh, available facts from different forms of knowledge that we have to catch up with other um, actors that send different messages. Hey, thank you all for those responses. Um, I think, unfortunately, we've been talking for over an hour now. I'm sure we could talk for far longer about some of these topics, um, but I think this is a good point to end with a message around learning, humility, and empathy for science communications. Um, thank you all to all the attendees for your excellent questions. There were many that we didn't have chance to look at today, and we will collate those um, and share them on our website with the recording of this webinar and with links to some of the resources that have been mentioned uh, in this webinar. So thank you to all of our presenters. Um, this is the first in a series of transformation talks and in later editions we're going to be looking more deeply at some of the topics that have been mentioned today, um, such as social media or the power of art to tell stories. So please keep an eye on our website for the new dates for those webinars and we wish you, we hope you'll be able to join us. Until then, uh, we wish you all the best and we look forward to seeing you at the next webinar. Thank you.